In the late 1970s and early 80s, the United States developed a fleet of reusable space planes that would quickly become iconic symbols of NASA and the American dominance in space exploration. Only this is not one of them. This isn't even America, it's Kazakhstan. But that is a real space shuttle, and its name was Buran. America wasn't the only country that could build a big white rocket plane. The Soviet Union did it too. Some would even say that the Soviets actually did it better. And yet, the Soviet space shuttle remains largely unknown, vanishing into obscurity as quickly as it arrived. The 1970s was a weird decade for the United States, a transitional period. The 60s had ended with a feverish explosion of cultural change. The hippie movement, the moon landing, political assassinations, civil rights, war in Vietnam, Richard Nixon, and then, as quickly as it had come, it was all over. Things had quieted down as the world waited to see what happens next. Inside NASA, the same cultural change had taken hold. They'd won the space race. America had landed on the moon so many times that they were already bored of it, and the Apollo era was over, so now what? The space shuttle had promised to be the next big thing. The idea had been born from the innovation of the late 1960s, a reusable workhorse spaceship that could deliver people and cargo to low Earth orbit over and over again, the pickup truck of the space program and it would drive a new era of construction in low Earth orbit, building space stations, fuel depots, interplanetary transport ships. The space shuttle would unlock the solar system. Meanwhile, in the Soviet Union, there was a similar period of transition. They had been on the losing end of the space race. They failed to keep up with the Americans, and a Soviet man would never walk on the moon. But they didn't give up. That's not how the Soviet Union worked. They just shifted the focus of their space program. The Soviets had a lot of the same ideas as the Americans. They got kind of obsessed with building space stations and sending probes to Venus. It was still a very active period for their space program. And while the Cold War was still on throughout this decade, tensions had massively chilled out. By the mid-70s, the two superpowers were starting to work together, even in space. This was best exemplified by the 1975 Apollo-Soyuz docking mission. The idea was simple. The Americans would launch an Apollo spacecraft into orbit, the Soviets would launch their Soyuz, then the two would meet up and dock together. When the hatch was opened, the two mission commanders shook hands and began two days of international cooperation in space. The crews conducted experiments together, shared meals, and checked out each other's spacecraft. Then they separated and returned home. On the surface, the mission was widely regarded as a huge step towards a lasting peace. But inside the Soviet Union, it did very little to calm their paranoia. The Soviets were concerned about NASA's new space shuttle program. From their point of view, this was actually a space weapon in disguise. What NASA was saying publicly about the shuttle's capability didn't make much sense. It was overpowered, overly complex, and launch costs were way too high for NASA's claim that the shuttle would be launching 60 times per year. What could they possibly be doing with all of that time spent in orbit? So in their mind, it had to be a military program. They must be testing new weapons up there. The shuttle had promised the ability to capture objects in space and bring them back down. It could steal entire satellites. And to their credit, the Soviets weren't wrong. A lot of the shuttle program didn't make any sense. The US Air Force was heavily involved in the design, and it definitely could have been weaponized against other nations. So four years after NASA's shuttle program was approved, the Soviets had begun development of their own space plane, Buran. It was pretty much the same philosophy that had driven the nuclear arms race just a decade before. A deterrent. If you do something bad to me, then I'll do the same bad thing to you, and then no one wins, except this time around, copying the American technology had proved to be shockingly easy. Nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles had been classified at the highest level. It had taken serious espionage for Soviet operatives to steal Oppenheimer's design for the nuclear bomb. But the space shuttle was not a classified government operation. All of the research papers and design blueprints were freely available, or 
as available as anything could be in the 1970s. It's not like you could just Google it, but the Americans had been starting to experiment with a very early version of the internet. NASA was storing documents in an online database and the Soviet KGB intelligence agency was able to hack their way into those online resources. They found research papers associated with the shuttle's airframe, flight computer, heat shield material, and propulsion system. Again, 1970s, so they couldn't just pull the document up on a screen. The paper itself wasn't on the internet. What they had was the document reference number. But that was good enough because now all they had to do was walk into the US Embassy, request that specific document, which was not classified, so there was no reason not to give it to them, and then the KGB just paid the embassy staff to print out a copy that they could take home. The Soviets used this method to acquire over 3,000 documents associated with NASA's space shuttle development. It got so bad that when Americans finally caught on to what they were doing, NASA had to start publishing fake research papers with faulty information that would throw the Soviets off their tail. But even with the ability to copy NASA's design note for note, the Soviets made some big changes in how they approached Buran. The biggest difference was in the propulsion system. The shuttle orbiter had three integrated rocket engines and they needed fuel, lots of it, but there was nowhere near enough room on the orbiter to hold it all. So the shuttle had to be strapped to a gigantic external fuel tank. And even still, those three engines didn't make nearly enough power to get the shuttle and its fuel off the ground. So the tank was then strapped with two side boosters that burned solid propellant. None of this is ideal, by the way. Once the orbiter separated from the main tank, those three rocket engines become useless. In spite of what you've probably seen in 90s action movies, the space shuttle engines were never fired up in space to fly around. It did have small thrusters that could change its orbit and orientation, but the main engines are just dead weight up there. The side boosters were also problematic. This is the cheapest way to produce a large amount of thrust, but solid rocket motors are also uncontrollable. Once they start, they cannot be stopped. They can't be throttled down. They just go until they burn out. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but for a spacecraft with people on board, you generally want as much control over the flight as possible. And to their credit, the Soviets were able to identify most of the problems with NASA's shuttle design and come up with their own solutions. First off, Buran did not have rocket engines. They recognized that it was basically useless to put them on the orbiter, so they just didn't do that. And instead, they did something pretty genius. They put jet engines on their shuttle like an airplane. These also can't help it maneuver in space, but it does mean that when the shuttle is inside Earth's atmosphere, it can fly under its own power. NASA's orbiter could only glide, which again is not ideal. It means that you only get one shot at a landing. If anything doesn't line up, you can't just fly away and try again. This ship only goes one way, down. The NASA orbiter also had no abort system of any kind, while the Soviets built ejection seats into their own design. So not only could Buran fly and land like a normal jet airplane, it could also take off like one, meaning it could easily move from one location to another without any special hardware. But the biggest change that they made was concentrating all of the rocket power into a dedicated booster stage for Buran. This would essentially become a standalone super heavy launcher in its own right, something that the shuttle could ride to orbit, but it could also carry different payloads as well. They named the booster stage Energia, which means energy, and it was packed full of that. Just like the American shuttle, the center core of Energia burned liquid hydrogen fuel for maximum efficiency. Then they took it up a notch by using four engines while NASA only had three. And then instead of strapping simple solid fuel boosters to the sides like the Americans, Energia had four orbital class Zenit rockets attached, each equipped with the single most powerful liquid fueled rocket engine ever made, the RD-170. This gave Energia a maximum payload capacity of 100 metric tons to low Earth orbit just slightly less than NASA's Saturn V booster that powered the Apollo moon landings, but still significantly more capable than any operational rocket that has been built in the four decades since Energia lifted off. While the first flight of the Energia booster in 1985 did not carry the Buran shuttle, it did have a very interesting payload on board, the Polyus, 
which was a massive spacecraft weighing in at 80 metric tons. Polyus was eventually revealed to have been an orbital weapons platform that was designed to destroy American satellites with a laser cannon. The Energia performed flawlessly, but the Polyus failed to reach orbit. Following separation from the booster core, the spacecraft was supposed to rotate 180 degrees before firing its engine. Instead, it rotated 360 degrees and ended up driving itself straight back down towards the Earth and crashed into the Pacific Ocean. It was not until 1988 that the Buran shuttle and the Energia booster were finally brought together for their maiden voyage. The Buran was uncrewed and carried no payload on its first flight. Energia lifted the orbiter into space, where it separated and then rose to a low Earth orbit of around 250 kilometers. Buran circled the Earth twice before firing up a deorbit burn and returning back to the launch site, where the orbiter successfully landed on the runway under fully autonomous control. It was actually the first space plane to perform an uncrewed orbital flight and land in autopilot. The only problem with Buran was that it all came too late in the game. NASA had already launched their own shuttle in 1981, and in the time since then it had become clear to the Soviets that the American orbiter was nowhere near the military threat that they had anticipated. And just like the Americans, the Soviet government was finally met with the reality of just how costly and inefficient it is to operate a reusable space plane. Only NASA had put all of their eggs into one basket. They had no other option for getting people into space aside from the shuttle. Meanwhile, the Soviets still had the Soyuz spacecraft going strong, so they didn't actually need a space plane. And then of course, there was the collapse of the Soviet Union that began just after the first Buran launch. So money and resources quickly became far too tight for the program to go on. In total, there were three Buran orbiters constructed. Only one was ever flight ready, and that space plane was unceremoniously stashed away in its hangar near the Kazakhstan launch site for decades until the building eventually fell into disrepair, and then the roof literally fell in and crushed the Buran. There is a full-scale model of the Buran on display at the Technik Museum in Speyer, Germany, just south of Frankfurt. It never had functioning systems installed, but it was used for early wind tunnel testing. And then, as far as we know, the remaining two orbiters are still packed away in a hangar in the desert of Kazakhstan, essentially just left to rot and collect dust, though they are occasionally visited by curious explorers willing to evade the Russian military guards and sneak into old Soviet buildings.